Before moving into a new home, one should always check the history of the area. For the residents of Minor Avenue in Hamilton, Ohio, researching the history of the street must have stunned them. A massacre and a gruesome murder were conducted about 20 years apart, both on Minor Avenue. In fact, they were right across the street from one another. These are the cases of the Rupert Family Massacre and Tina Mott. Hey listeners, welcome back to the Abyss Pod. I'm Brittany. And I'm Hallie. And we're really excited that you're joining us here again. Don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you listen on. Give us a five-star rating. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook for all the updates and information about some cases we find interesting and future cases and all that kind of stuff. Also, if you would like to support the show a little bit, we now have a Patreon. The link will be on our website, theabysspod.com, so you can check that out if you'd like to support our show a little bit and help us continue doing what we do. So let's jump into the abyss. The Rupert family was very large. Charity Rupert had two boys, Leonard and James. Their father passed away when James and Leonard were very young, but he made sure to speak his mind about all of James' mistakes and failures. Overall, James was a pretty average kid, very quiet and shy, and Leonard, being the older brother, was very successful and kind of placed James in the shadows. It didn't help that his mother always mentioned that she would have preferred a girl to James, and this really brought him down throughout his childhood and into his adolescence. He was battling depression and even attempted to hang himself with sheets when he was 16 years old. This continued into his adult life. He was only about 5'5 and 130 pounds, so he was fairly small in size. He started collecting guns and became a really skilled marksman. He did a good job of staying out of trouble and had no police record. However, as an adult, he was still seen as a failure. He was unemployed at the age of 41 and still residing with his mother, Charity. She had to support James along with some help from his brother, Leonard. To add to the problem, James was also an alcoholic who spent endless nights at a local bar called the 19th Hole. Where was the money coming from to buy all of this alcohol, you may ask? Charity's wallet. This really bothered her. She wanted James to get a job and to get married, but he wasn't really big on the dating scene. He had gotten engaged once, but he was rejected by his fiance. And another time he dated a woman named Alma who ended up leaving him to marry his older brother, Leonard. They ended up having eight children together. And this really just drove in the stake that Leonard was better than him. And he got everything he wanted. He was successful and James was no more than a mess up. This was quite the stab to him and it really pushed him deeper into the abyss. On the outside, James appeared normal and calm and even kind, but on the inside, he was filled with rage. In 1975, Charity had finally had enough of James just mooching off of her financially. He was 41 and not doing anything with his life and she was just done with him. She threatened to have him evicted if he couldn't manage to get his life together. This situation caused a lot of stress on James, and he started to become a little bit paranoid. He believed that his mother and Leonard were whispering about him behind his back and even telling the FBI about him. What was he concerned that they were telling the FBI? We're not quite sure. Since James was a pretty good kid, a kind and quiet adult, he had a very clean criminal history, it seems like whatever he may have thought that they were whispering about him to the FBI wasn't really valid information to be transferred. James also started to suspect that Leonard was messing with his car, a Volkswagen, by setting up traps or pranks or just fidgeting with it in a way that may mess up its functions. So it's clear that James was extremely paranoid and believed that his family was kind of out to get him. He didn't feel supported. On March 29th, 1975, James went to drink at the bar again and got sloshed per usual. There was a woman at the bar that he talked to occasionally, and she recalled him mentioning this problem with his mother that was causing him a lot of distress. 
She asked him that night if he had fixed the problem with his family yet, and James said, quote, not yet, end quote. The conversation was brushed off and the drinking proceeded until around 3 a.m. when James finally made his way back to his mother's home to sleep off the effects of alcohol. The following day on Easter of 1975, James slept off his hangover throughout the day. While he slept, the Ohio home was filled with people for the holiday. The whole family had gathered for the Easter celebration, and while James slept off the alcohol, the rest of the family had a fun Easter egg hunt outside and just enjoyed their time together. Around 5 p.m., James decided to make his way downstairs. Leonard asked him how the Volkswagen was, which, because James was already very paranoid, this really escalated his fear and anger, and he went back upstairs and started plotting. About an hour later, James took a 357 Magnum, two 22 handguns, and a rifle and went to find the family. He came upon the kitchen first, where Charity, Alma, and Leonard were talking. James shot Leonard, aged 42, first. Then he turned the gun on Charity, aged 65, and Alma, aged 38. Anne, aged 12, Teresa, aged 9, and David, aged 11, were also in the kitchen and were shot. Leonard III, aged 17, came to the doorway to see what was going on and was killed next. James went over to the couch and sat down, shooting the remaining four children, Michael, age 16, Thomas, age 15, Carol, age 13, and John, just four years old. James had been so quick that no one had a chance to escape. I'm sure the entire family was so stunned that it would have been really hard for them to process what was going on and try to get out of that situation. Upon examination later, it was found that most of the bodies had gunshot wounds that disabled them before the fatal shot. One of the children had tried to escape, making it as far as cracking the door, but was killed before she could make any further moves. James used a total of 35 rounds in this crime. About three hours later, James himself called the police, telling them that there had been a shooting, and then he calmly waited for them to arrive. When the police arrived at the scene, it was far worse than they had imagined. They saw James standing at the door, along with bodies of children visible behind him. James was immediately handcuffed, and the officers ended up having to walk through the house to ensure that there was no accomplice at the scene. What they saw before them was atrocious. There were dead bodies everywhere with Easter decorations and colorful baskets. Three pistols were in the living room, two on a table and one on the armrest of a couch, and there was a rifle propped against the fridge in the kitchen. The only visible sign of struggle was a knocked over waste basket. If you go on our website, you can see a diagram that shows the location of everyone's body in the house and where they would be in relation to one another. And it's really horrifying when you look at it. It's just so many people. The family was clearly caught off guard and fearful and the event happened relatively quickly for no one to be able to fight back. The county prosecutor, John Holcomb, was scarred by the Rupert family massacre. Holcomb said, quote, I stepped into all that carnage It was so bad that when I went into the basement, you had to be careful because the blood would seep through the floorboards and it would drip on you, end quote. I can't imagine being at the scene, much less even just reading about it. It's horrifying. Obviously, that's horrifying at any time, but the fact that they were celebrating and having fun and it was a day of family being together and just having a carefree time to have that juxtaposed to 11 bodies, mostly children. That's just such a horrifying thought. The funeral was held at the Sacred Hearts Catholic Church, and it consisted of 11 caskets lined in the aisle from end to end. About one year later, the Rupert home was open to the public, and it was filled with news reporters. Nancy O'Connor with the Journal News recalls the unclean crime scene and was quoted in the Dayton Daily News saying, quote, I remember going into the house the first day of the trial that summer, when reporters were allowed to go inside. The house had been closed up since the initial investigation, and it was stifling inside with the smell of dried blood, and there were many bullet holes visible in the walls and floors. There was a coin laying on the linoleum floor, a quarter splattered with dried blood. A skillet full of what looked like hamburger helper was still on the stove in the kitchen, end quote. I just can't fathom that they would leave a crime scene in that state for about a year and then just open it up to the public. That shocks me. 
However, they quickly started auctioning off the Rupert's belongings and proceeded to clean and fix the home and then sold it. At the trial, with the help of attorney Hugh Holbrock, James Rupert pled not guilty by reason of insanity. They said James suffered from paranoid persecution complex, which is a mental disorder in which the person afflicted feels extreme paranoia and distrust of other people. It's pretty much always unfounded and just sort of made up in their head as a delusion, but it can feel very real to them. To confirm this to the courts, James was assigned a psychiatrist for testing. However, the murders were found to have been premeditated as James had been seen using cans as target practice at the Great Miami River and had also asked about purchasing a silencer when he was buying ammunition. James Rupert, being the sole heir to the estate, was set to inherit about $300,000, but only if he could be found not guilty. All of this was a blow to his insanity plea, and it was ultimately rejected. Rupert was convicted of all 11 murders and was sentenced to life for each one. Because the death penalty was in sort of a tenuous position during this period of time, he avoided that. His attorney, Hugh Holbrock, told the New York Times, quote, There are 11 dead, the most horrible thing that has happened in the United States of America in a long time. Do not make this a worse crime by adding a 12th person. Gentlemen, death serves no purpose. Only God can give a life. Let him take it. If he has spared his life, at least we will have remained a civilized nation rather than return to barbaric times. I say to you the words, Thou shalt not kill is as applicable to the state as it is to any individual, end quote. James appealed this conviction, and in 1982, he received a new trial. In this trial, he was convicted of just the first-degree murder of his mother and brother, but on the other nine counts, he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. He was resentenced and received two life sentences. James attempted to get parole in 1995, and in 2005, he was denied both times. His next parole hearing will be in 2025, and he will be 90 years old. This crime really shook the community and the people that knew the Rupert family. Jim Irwin, a neighbor of Leonard and Alma, and the father of Michael Rupert's best friend Greg, visits the cemetery every year. Irwin recalls Michael being loving and had even brought a cocoon over to the Irwin home to share it with them. About a week after the murders, the cocoon opened and a butterfly emerged. So that's kind of a sweet little thing that they could remember Michael by. Jim Irwin said, quote, The thing that makes it so horrendous when I think of the ages of these children, he killed 600 years of human life, end quote. And that's definitely super haunting to think about. These were just kids. Even Alma and Leonard were still pretty young. All of these people had a lot of life left in them. They had a lot to do. And especially for the children, they were never even given that opportunity to just explore life and have everything that should have been promised to them. The years after the Rupert family massacre left neighbors in shock as they all recovered from the incident. Minor Avenue would stay relatively quiet for the next 20 years. Tina Mott lived in New York and was enjoying her early 20s. One day, a young man came up to her selling magazines at her door. He introduced himself as Timothy Bradford, and they hit it off immediately. They started hanging out, and Tina learned more and more about Timothy. He had been adopted as a baby by Howard and Elizabeth Bradford. Initially, Howard and Elizabeth tried to adopt following the appropriate legal process, but they were rejected since Howard had to move a lot for work. They decided to take matters into their own hands and contact a person who could get them a child. They were introduced to a drug addict in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who was on the verge of labor and wanted the baby gone immediately. Once Timothy was born, it was clear that he had some medical problems that needed to be addressed. He was malnourished and frail, his skull had not been fully developed, and he was having some respiratory problems. It took a toll on Howard and Elizabeth, but he was slowly able to function better and better until the day he could go home with them in Hamilton, Ohio. Timothy was bullied a lot through his school years for being a mixed kid with white parents. When Timothy was five, Howard taught him how to hunt, skin, and cook animals, and this was an activity that he grew very fond of, and it kind of took him away from the stressful reality that he lived in at school. Tina grew to care about Timothy more and more, and eventually they ended up getting pregnant. At age 21, Tina decided to move to Hamilton, Ohio to be with her child's father. Her friends did not support the move and believed that she should stay with her friends and family instead. 
However, she didn't listen and made the long haul to be with Timothy. They lived at 622 Minor Avenue, directly across the street from the infamous Rupert family massacre. This made Tina uncomfortable. She even said that the idea of being murdered was something very scary and unsettling to her. Timothy got a new job as an art framer, and Tina got a job as a clerk at Thriftway. Tina's co-workers all said that she was very kind-hearted and reliable. She was always showing up for work on time and super dependable. Neither of their jobs were full-time, unfortunately, so Timothy's mother, Elizabeth, helped them out financially in order to support their child. Tina felt hesitant about the situation. She was fearful for no reason other than her gut instinct that Elizabeth would take the baby after he was born. She ignored the feeling and tried to be grateful for Elizabeth's assistance. After giving birth to her son, Johnny, and living together for a bit, Tina started to become very agitated. Timothy wasn't putting in enough effort around the house, he could not hold down a full-time job, and he was always doing drugs with his friends. This really pushed Tina past her breaking point, and one night they got into an intense argument. According to Timothy's accounts of the night, he said that Tina ended up getting annoyed and just left to go visit some family in New York and kind of cool off. After she left in June of 1996, Timothy told his mother, Elizabeth, that Tina had just gone to visit family and she had left the baby in Elizabeth's care. Timothy also rented a storage unit around this time, but no alarms were really raised. Elizabeth was unfazed initially at the news of Tina leaving, but after a while, she tried to check in with Tina in New York, and that's when she learned that Tina had never made it there. She also thought it was very strange that Tina would leave Johnny behind. Then to find that she had never made it to her destination, Elizabeth was definitely suspicious. Elizabeth reported Tina Mott missing on June 4th, and Detective Jim Nugent took the case. Elizabeth begged Detective Nugent not to tell Timothy that she had called. She was afraid of what he might do. She knew he had a big temper. That must have raised a lot of suspicion with the police for his own mother to be scared of him and for her to be the one reporting Tina missing. Detectives contacted friends and family and other people that Tina may have been in contact with, but no one could tell him any information about Tina's whereabouts. It's like she had just vanished into thin air. Elizabeth told the detectives that in addition to Timothy's temper and violence that he was also into practicing devil worship and using drugs. Tina's friends stated that she had mentioned being afraid of Timothy when he was under the influence of drugs, so that was definitely a theme that ran through the entire investigation. On August 7th, 1996, two young boys, Tim Lyons and TJ Dijon, were fishing in Linden Lake. Their fun day took a turn when they found what they thought was a human skull. They left the skull in place and ran off to tell their parents. Initially, the adults thought it was just the imagination of two kids and they were just kind of dismissed. But the next day, the boys saw that the skull was still there and finally the alarm was raised. Unfortunately, the first cop to the scene was pretty unprofessional. He apparently acted like it was a huge inconvenience for him to be there doing his job and even threw a rock at the skull, making a comment that it was in fact real. As one should when they find a skull or evidence of some sort. Let's just tamper with it or throw rocks at it. Good idea. Literally, the two young boys that found it were more respectful than the cop. (laughs) Honestly. (laughs) Police searched the lake and the surrounding area to look for more information. Divers searched the lake floor but came up empty-handed. Cadaver dogs were brought in, but they didn't find anything either. On August 9th, 1996, Timothy was questioned by Detective Nugent. Timothy said that Tina had left to visit family in New York and left the baby. Same story he had given his mother, who was taking care of Johnny. His version of the night that she left was that they were playing board games and got into a fight, and she stormed off without another word, and he never heard from her again. Because Tina never made it to New York, the detective was extremely suspicious of Timothy, and Timothy was followed around town just to see what he was up to. After examining the skull, it was clear it had only been in the water for a short period of time because some of the soft tissue was still present. The skull was sent to the College of Mount St. Joseph to be examined by Dr. Beth Murray. Now, Dr. Murray was one of... Now, Dr. Murray was one out of 63 board-certified forensic anthropologists in America. So, she was one of the few people in her field in the country, and she really knew what she was doing. 
She was able to determine from the nose cavity that it was a young Caucasian female that was under the age of 35. She noted that a sharp tool was used on top of the skull, and there were other marks all over the skull showing the use of different tools to remove flesh. This included serrated knives and small blades. In addition, there were puncture wounds in the bone behind her eyes, showing that someone forcibly removed her eyeballs from the sockets. The lower jaw was missing and the teeth had been removed with a needle nose plier. In the pictures, it looks like a little small chunk was kind of cut out of the bone. And this was done in an attempt to prevent identification of the victim. Luckily, though, the victim had two wisdom teeth that were still present because they had not popped out of the gums yet. Police started looking into missing people in the area and saw that Tina Mott matched the description that the skull provided. Using the quote-unquote tooth pulp from the left wisdom tooth, they were able to run a DNA test in comparison to Tina's 18-month-old son, Johnny. Unfortunately, the pulp didn't have enough DNA to get an accurate reading, so they decided to take an alternative route where they were going to get mitochondrial DNA from the skull itself by drilling out little bone samples. Johnny's DNA matched, and the remains were confirmed to be Tina Mott. Police obtained a search warrant to take a look at the storage unit that Timothy rented. In it, they found a set of 19 kitchen knives of varying sizes, some smooth, some serrated, One of the knives tested positive for quote-unquote human protein, but they could not determine specifics based on that. Also in the unit was a book about killing without weapons, which I feel like that's something that's come up a lot in the cases that we've talked about, and maybe I just don't go to the right section of the library, but it always astounds me how many books there are just about killing people. And why those would even be published. I just don't get that. There were also notebooks full of things about satanic rituals in the storage unit, which corroborated what Tim's mother said about his interest in devil worship. Police searched Timothy and Tina's apartment and found blood on the living room carpet. There was also blood in the crack where the bathtub meets the floor and around the toilet. They checked further into Timothy and found that he had withdrawn money from Tina's bank account right after Tina went missing. Timothy was brought in for questioning again and... He talked about knowing how to hunt and how to field dress animals, skinning and dissecting them and preparing them, and even dumping the remains. Police then told him about the pile of evidence that they had against him, and ultimately he confessed to killing Tina. He said that night they were playing board games, and a fight did start. Timothy was on drugs, and in the fight he hit Tina, giving her a bloody nose. She went to the bathroom to clean up, and he started cleaning up fishing gear that he had laying around. According to Timothy, Tina then came running out of the bathroom to argue some more, and he slit her throat with a fishing knife that he had in his hand. He then said he left the apartment and came back and saw Tina was in the bathtub but didn't know how she had gotten there. He spent the next several hours trying to dismember her body, even flushing some of her organs down the toilet. He admitted to using all of the 19 knives found in the storage unit as well as needle nose pliers. He took evidence and her personal belongings and her body and dumped them in a field, scattering her bones and then tossing her skull in Linden Lake. Timothy showed the police where he had thrown her body, but because of animal scavenging, only about half of the body could be collected. There was a lot of evidence of the body being dismembered and it just stacked the case against Timothy. In September of 1997, Timothy pleaded guilty and was convicted of voluntary manslaughter and abuse of a corpse. He was sentenced to 12 to 25 years in prison. This case appeared on an episode of Forensic Files, and apparently Timothy sent a letter to the show saying, quote, I have committed an atrocity in the eyes of God and of man, and for that I accept full responsibility, end quote. This is strange, and it seems kind of cold or kind of clinical. He was known to practice devil worship, so it seems like kind of a 180 from that as well. And above all, he doesn't apologize or show any remorse for Tina or her family. It kind of seems like, in a way, he wanted to give people the answers that they wanted, like kind of the manipulative side of him, but he wasn't very good at it. You know what I mean? In June of 2015, Timothy received a parole hearing but was denied. It was determined that he would have to serve the maximum sentence of 25 years. This means that he will be released from prison December 6th of 2023, which is coming up pretty quick. 
In April of 2020, the top floor apartment where Tina and Timothy lived caught fire from the patio. It seems like this street just dealt with so much tragedy in one little area. Yeah, it's really eerie to think about so much happening in an area, kind of like it might be cursed or something, you know? Not a place that I would prefer to live now or any time in the future. <laughs> um, I feel like I have seen some petitions and stuff online about his release and trying to keep him behind bars. So if you're interested in that, definitely research it um, because his release date is coming up pretty soon. So that pretty much wraps up our episode on these two cases. If you enjoyed it, please give us a five-star rating and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any episodes. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter, Facebook. Um, We post all of our episodes on YouTube as well. So Um, If you prefer to listen that way, go for it. We have a pretty good community of people in there and we'd love to hear your thoughts on these cases and any other information you might have or even suggestions for future cases. If you'd like to support the show a little bit more, we have our Patreon. We'll have that linked on our website, theabysspod.com and we'd really appreciate it. So thank you guys for jumping into the abyss with us again and we will catch you next time. Bye. There was a coin laying in the lith- There was a coin laying in the lin- There was a coin laying in the lin- <laughs> This is how we do it. This is how we do it. What is happening in this household? <laughs> That's some so many different noises <laughs> happening. And, 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 Got it for note. <laughs> <laughs> <Good>. <laughs>